The first 5G World event in London attracted a range of vendors, operators and ecosystem partners, not to mention a connected car or two. The major infrastructure players were keen to showcase their latest 5G ready technology and there was plenty of debate about use cases and services. We are working uh, hard also in uh, cloud run transformation and we want to, to, to anticipate also this uh, uh, architectural change uh, of uh, 5G uh, because uh, we, we, we want to protect the investments that we, we do in, uh, in LTE network and uh, create a smooth migration, uh, technological migration and network migration toward 5G. For us it's fundamental that uh, the 5G uh, the new access uh, and uh, X, uh, interface, radio interface, coexists with the existing uh, LTE interface and also bring uh, the new architecture, the new core network, the network slicing, uh, also bring this uh, on a 4G network in order to have uh, the commissioning to G and 3G and create a new single network that could address all the use case. We need to prepare the network now for 5G, we need to build a foundation. How do we do this? First of all, uh, you need to have a, a great LTE coverage uh, because 5G will work together with LTE. Uh, so LTE is the basis for everything. So it means um, um, on top of LTE we are building a new radio access system but uh, via multi-connectivity uh, the new 5G radio be it in a millimeter wave spectrum or be it on a lower frequency bands will work perfectly together with you know the existing infrastructure and of course everything will be done you know uh, via the same architecture so we need to prepare the architecture for this we need to introduce cloud to the network software defined networking to the network and this uh, if you uh, do it well, it will also provide the basis, you know, to have a proper slicing um, uh, infrastructure in place. And this is also what we are demonstrating here live. Network slicing is using the same physical network infrastructure for different kinds of services with very diverse requirements. So it means we are basically uh, slicing uh, this physical infrastructure into different uh, virtual subnetworks. And every subnetwork is tailored to a specific, you know, use case, be it automotive, be it manufacturing, be it healthcare. Um, now, uh, the crucial thing about this is uh, network slicing is not only virtualizing the network. Um, it's really about, you know, uh, being able to uh, create a slice end to end. That means from the end, uh, from the radio. Uh, side to the core to the trends but even to the application server only if you are able to create such a slice end-to-end -end, you will be able as an operator to manage this kind of uh, network as a service uh, offering um, to, uh, to your customers and only then you are able to charge for it well 5g is expected to create a united uh, radio access but at the same time uh, 5g will not replace 4g or other technology like Wi-Fi. So we are expecting a scenario where there are multiple radio access, totally transparent to the uh, users. In terms of the technology, we strongly believe that the OFDM is the technology that will be part of the 5G, because it's a technology that can be scalable across multiple use cases and multiple frequency bands. So back to your question on the frequency band, we have now already a test bed in place working on the millimeter wave 28 gigahertz and uh, now we just announced the new test bed that is working on the sub 6 gigahertz because depending on the use cases so you go from the ultra broadband above uh, the millimeter wave so 10 gigabit uh, even more capacity while uh, on the other side you have uh, IoT use cases, mission critical use cases, autonomous driving where it's not a matter of uh, uh, capacity but it's a matter of other performance and you can do that in the uh, lower frequency band. In Europe in particular 3.4, 3.8 is the very promising frequency for the 5G. You know, 5G in and of itself is a really interesting new spectrum. It offers a lot of new capabilities, particularly around very low latency. Uh, as well as pushing it greater functionality to the edge of the network. What's going to be more important in many ways is the technologies that are coming around the cloud and what they're going to do to network function virtualization. In particular, microservices architecture. Microservices give us a fundamental way to rebuild a lot of that core functionality and to do so in a way that will make it far more scalable and far more flexible than it's ever been in the past.
Microservices is a new way to architect software. And software traditionally has been built by large teams working together with, to have a common database, a common UI, built all as a big monolith. With microservices, functions are broken into much smaller units. And each unit is built as an autonomous uh, piece of software, autonomous piece of functionality. By bringing those pieces together in those much smaller way, they can scale much more easily, they can be adapted much more quickly, and we really get to the level of flexibility that we see in our IT friends. People like Facebook and Google, LinkedIn, other companies of that company, that evolve their services very rapidly. Uh, Facebook, for example, does hundreds of releases a day. Imagine a telephone operator being able to do hundreds of different versions of their software in a single day. We're lucky to get a release out every 18 months. So a typical 3G, 4G uh, network quality assurance is based on different types of probes that you uh, locate at different uh, points of interest in the network. You sample traffic or you inject test traffic and based on that you, you make an assumption of, of how the service operates on top of that. For 5G, this will have to change because uh, the network infrastructure of a 5G network will be virtual machines talking to each other, uh, uh, delivering packets between themselves. There is no way to inject physical probes in a, in a 5G uh, transport network. Also, the increased capacity of all the links, of all the bandwidth going through, uh, makes it uh, uh, virtually impossible to instrument such a network with physical devices at uh, different locations. That's where uh, companies like Axidian uh, for quite some time have uh, evolved our solutions to be software based. So uh, virtual machines that do uh, uh, analysis of, uh, of packets in the network, but also do testing, probing, uh, ensuring that the latencies are within track, uh, uh, et cetera. So we, we already today sell these virtual solutions to a couple of our customers uh, that are preparing their uh, path into 5G, because even in a 4G network, you can, of course, make use of software-based solutions. And for us, 5G is uh, not only a new radio interface. So 5G is a completely you know, architecture and and it's about new possibilities, not only for the consumers, but also you know, for different industries. And uh, the first thing we want to show is uh, how far we are with 5G. And uh, we are showcasing here the world's first 5G-ready network. And this is really a network that's based on commercial available platforms. That means those commercial platforms you can buy already now, and we've implemented what the industry thinks 5G will be. And this is also a system we are using for trials uh, with our customers. It's not only about the technology, but also how we use the system. So think about, you have a factory, you have robots, and uh, if you want to have a flexible factory, you do not want to have cables in it. But at the same time, you want that the robots interacting together to produce something together. And of course, in such a scenario, uh, nothing should go wrong. And what we're showcasing here, this is basically how you can steer uh, a variety of robots uh, via a network connected to a cloud and how they are basically uh, doing something together in perfect harmony. And this is a showcase how 5G could be the basis for, of the factory of the future. So in the 5G World Summit we're going to be talking about robotic surgery and having that ability for sense of touch. We're working with a professor in Guy's Hospital and he's told us that having that sense of touch at a level of safety and a level of quality that he doesn't have at the moment. In the demo, there's going to be three component parts. There's going to be some video to show you real time what's going on from the kind of surgery point of view. There's going to be a sensor there, a little probe that looks like a finger that actually shows you where the tissue is, what, and the different sensors of the tissue, where the hard parts are and where the soft parts are. The hard parts are the cancerous tissue, the soft parts are where the kind of normal human flesh is. So we sense those very different sensors he, the robotic surgeon can understand exactly real time where the cancerous tissue is and where not and having the real time video to the side of him he can do that remotely we can extend this not within the same hospital but in manchester glasgow or wherever if you spend amount of time in virtual reality and you have at least about 50 millisecond delay after about 10 minutes you get some cyber sickness you think you feel slightly giddy because what you're doing and the reaction is slightly out of line so your brain is thinking something's quite wrong here. By reducing it to less than 50 milliseconds, you do get that thing, actually, I am here, I am experiencing exactly what's going on, and I can actually feel things as well. By having the sense of touch and being able to be able to feel things exactly as you touch it, 
adds quality, adds safety, and adds another, another level to what you can do over the internet. What happens next is incredible. Yeah. From a, um, a surgery point of view, from an education point of view, from a business point of view, the opportunities at the tactile internet will be amazing. This is Guy Daniels for Telecom TV at 5G World London.